Cool. So we will be going through machine learning basics today. Um, again, most of you did really well in the reading assignment. So hopefully most of these are not new things, but we'll go over them anyway in case you have questions. So we all know now that uh, AI ML is ubiquitous. It's in everything. It's in you know automating things that are routine and just generally boring. Um, understanding speech, everyone uses Siri or Alexa or some form of voice assistant. I know I use it a lot to set my alarms. Um, it's just easier. Autonomous vehicles. By the way, did anybody see the video of somebody in San Francisco destroying an autonomous vehicle because they got mad because their privacy were, was being stolen? Um, it, it was really funny, I thought. Um, because at least in San Francisco, in the past month, there have been like two accidents where the smart car did not Know, stop on time or did not account for human errors. Um, and so the people in the city are really mad about it. And somebody whose house was obviously being filmed, you know, Google Street Car or whatever, they started a car. Challenges of privacy. Um, so in the first instance of learning problems, when people didn't know, or I guess this is like I'm talking about the 80s or earlier than that, when Machine learning wasn't really a thing. People still wanted to automate what the you know whatever their work was using computers. Um, so people started making rule based systems, very simple decision trees like whether somebody has flu. So does patient does person have fever greater than X Y left right and so on. So very simple rule based systems. And then once those easier things were automated, people started running into problems like. Handwriting recognition. So it is easy for a computer to teach one font. Like me, I can look into the intricacies of one particular font and teach it to recognize members. Everyone has a unique handwriting. And when you consider the intricacies of all of those, it just expands into a massive problem. And that's why people start thinking about how can a model learn from other people's data instead of creating the rules ourselves. Um, one interesting thing is that Hard problems for people are easier for AI. Um, this, I think right now we are at a stage where AI can create things. So this is slightly outdated. We have generative AI now, but even then I think it's bad at reasoning. Um, and on the other hand, we are good at reasoning, but we hate doing repetitive tasks, which is where a computer helps. So that's sort of the paradox. Like, why is something that is so easy for us to like, I don't know, um, even concepts like morality, like will this hurt the other person or feeling or thinking? It's just hard for AI, but it can play chess or go very well on EPT. Um, so that has been this struggle between or towards the road to build AGI. Um, again, a concept that often comes up in AI lectures or AI classes or talks is, uh, artificial general intelligence, which is essentially creating bionic parts or brains or just an artificial brain that can do what human beings do, but we aren't there yet. So several different tasks require intelligence, um, require intelligence that goes beyond, you know, um, just doing math or, or, or adding two numbers. Um, and when you go from top to bottom, it just goes to more complex things that AI is still learning. Um, it currently does not have what we call as perception. We don't have models that can feel, think, sense, or act. But we are at a stage where it is able to generate natural language or start learning new skills um, called emergent behavior. Um, but yeah, so there's a rich tapestry on this job, um, making models do cool tasks. And as you might imagine, um, this, like, with time, these technologies have become more and more accessible, which means people now, or people slowly started using them in their day-to-day -day work. Um, I remember, like, when, uh, I mean, because I grew up in India, my dad did also, when banks in India, I want to say this was in the late 70s or early 80s, when they first introduced computers, 
people were so afraid of their jobs being taken that they. Hi, I'm from IT. Yes, the room camera is not showing up. Just check. You want us to? Okay. Um. Anyway, so yeah. So um. So. My dad, along with a bunch of other people, protested outside banks because they thought their lives would be harder, people would be fired. Um, all sorts of concerns, just like there was a lack of trust, which I think was paramount in people trusting machines. But then like nobody complains now. And, and as it turns out, the fears of jobs being taken away was somewhat premature because you still needed people to learn those systems. And instead, it, end up creating more jobs because banks then have to um uh, uh you want to do it in this game also I am I can So as I was saying, um, not only did, did banks end up implementing IT, it ended up creating more jobs because people were needed to maintain these systems. Um, and now even uh, in medicine, people are using these, people are using models to create new gene sequences and then test new functions on them. So ML is everywhere. Um, so one problem with rule-based systems is that there is nothing to be learned from data. So if you create a system which essentially um, requires you to define line by line what each rule means, um, that is going to be an unwieldy massive problem. And so people quickly moved on from um, knowledge-based handwritten rules to the second paradigm, which was the machine learning approach. Um, and the difficulties of this type of hard-coded approach suggests that there should be a way to allow computers to learn from previous experience. Um, so we first need to determine what features to use. So say the task is to learn somebody's handwriting and, and convert it to like create an OCR system. We need to first think what features there would be and the feature could be something as simple as the image of somebody's handwriting. But then you have to think more clearly like, is that enough? Do we need to do something with the input image itself? Do we need to make it sharper? Do we need to expect individual characters? Or say you have a facial recognition system. Um, it's not as simple as just putting everybody's faces through a classifier. You also have to do feature engineering, such as rotate the image, basically create more copies, um, take the person's face image in different angles. Because otherwise, if you just treat it on or teach it on one image, it will not learn properly. So there is more to do than just throw data at it. You have to do some feature engineering in the input stage, um, and then learn to map the features to outputs. Uh, models can be both linear and quadratic. So all of the neural network onwards, everything we do there are quadratic systems because they can learn nonlinearities. Um, but things like logistic regression or linear regression uh, are simple straight lines. Um, and yeah, they fail under more complex data. So pretty straightforward. You look into models. Uh, sorry, you, you select the model that you would use. You do, you do the data collection stage. Then you go to the model selection uh, stage. Um, basically, you know, this kind of involves several steps, like, and, and the reason why I'm giving this lecture, by the way, is so that when you first finally start doing your final project, you should be on the lookout for different types of models and different types of data use and where biases could and problems could occur. Um, so this is just to give like a large overview of all of the machine learning problems that exist so that like, we don't get a class of eight different projects on bank bias data. Um, but yeah, so um, you have the generalization step or the training step where you take previously existing data and you retrain it or, or you train your models on the existing data. 
the model learns a probability distribution of data and things with higher probabilities basically become final inferences. Uh, pretty simple supervised learning. Um, this was from the reading assignments and you have supervised, unsupervised and semi-supervised when you combine the two approaches. Like for example, if you did topic modeling first, it would be an unsupervised thing. But then if you use the topics learned from topic models too, then in a supervised system, it would be a, the overall thing would become semi-supervised. Um, and reinforcement learning, which is the newer paradigm where um, an agent learns from its own environment through things called rewards. Um, so those are the paradigms based on the type of data or the type of learning. Um, based on the type of output, it could be a classification system where the final outputs are distinct categories, like whether a piece of handwriting is zero or one or two or three, these are all classes. Or you could get a regression output, which is a continuous output. So predict the price of my home based on certain factors, like how many bedrooms, number of square feet, my zip code, how many, when was it constructed and so on. When you feed these things, it's, it's sort of dollar value and not like a class of low income income and so on. So that's regression. Um, based on the type of model, models can be either generative or discriminative. So most models that are classical and we talk about the most are um, discriminative models. So classified is, classified is a discriminative model. It discriminates the data into different uh, buckets or different classes. Um, but we also have generative models which actually create continue, continuous output. So you have ChatGPT, which is a generative model. You have things like stable diffusion, which is a generative model. Um, so different paradigms of machine learning has gone to different stages. We also, by the way, um, Generative models nowadays, that's the most cutting edge thing. Generative models now use reinforcement learning also. So is anybody familiar with the term RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback? So while training generative models, like while training large language models, there's a new technique where at every stage, there is like an actual human sitting and saying, okay, this seems like a problematic text and you should not generate it. So that's the reward given by the environment. And if it's a negative reward, that model will learn to not generate something like that and, and shift its weights. Or if it's a positive reward that, okay, the way you said this sounded really good. So it will continue to do that. So if you say, generate a poem about Abhijit Kosh teaching this class in the style of Shakespeare. And if I like, if I was the human doing the feedback and I could like the poem, I would say this sounds good. Um, so these are all new techniques and obviously that can be an additional source of bias. If you are um, hired by OpenAI to do reinforcement learning with human feedback and you're feeding your own you know, senses of bias, your model will become misaligned. So something to keep an eye out for. Um, we, uh, in fact, now let's talk about supervised learning. Again, like in the paper you all read, um, most widely used methods of machine learning is supervised learning. Most systems are uh, basically trying to learn from previous data and, and corral data into different classes and different um, and or make like some final prediction. Um, so some popular examples are email spam classification. So Google uses a machine learning model to do spam classification. You have face recognition, um, medical diagnosis systems, they're all supervised learning, learning from previous patients, uh, you know, disease history. Um, inputs and vectors are more complex objects. Um, so in the paper, remember you had X as an input, it learned a function FX and the output was Y. So that function being learned is the model. Um, so in that case, the inputs are vectors or more complex objects. So you can either feed something very directly like an image and hope that the input layers will learn the mappings as you saw in figure three of the paper. Um, or if it was something more complex, for example, say you are Netflix and you are trying to predict if, trying to predict like new movies to a person, that's not information that is easily feedable to a model. Like, you can't really feed it a list of movies without giving it more information. So people feed vectors of like things you have watched in the past. 
So I am a person, say Netflix has 10,000 movies. I have watched 50 of them. So it will look like my vector of Netflix would look like a 10,000 long vector with the 50s movies I've watched as having some value and the rest be zeros. And that would be the input of whether or not I would like the next movie model. Um, outputs can be binary or multi-class. We talked about regression classification, same thing. Um, it could also be unstructured, and that is less common. Most of most of the time, they're structured in some upper bound or lower bound and so on. Um, okay, so interesting. This did not show up on the I guess it's because of the black background. Um, but yeah, unsupervised learning, as you all saw in the paper, is basically clustering to find partitions of data. Um, uh, so when you don't have uh, a way to convert, sorry, if when you don't have something to learn from, so for example, topic models, a supervised way to do topic models would be if you already knew what topic each document was about. But when you don't know and you just have a large encyclopedia of documents and you want to group them into related categories, you would use a method like clustering, which pushes things into higher dimension, takes a bunch of words. Um, um, each word is represented as a vector in the massive long English dictionary. And then that creates clusters, which then becomes the topics. Um, and usually, these large dimensional vectors are so large that they're very sparse. So you would probably, like the example I just gave, you would have 50 ones and the rest of them zeros, like 9,900-ish zeros. And that's really bad for computing because you just waste a bunch of memory. So there are techniques like PCA or autoencoders to compress long vectors into smaller vectors. So it is theoretically possible for me to add um, I'll not go through all these details because it's not super necessary right now, but PCA, for example, is a technique called principal component analysis that takes these long vectors and uses a bunch of techniques to compress them into, say, a vector of length 50. Um, but then each vector is a combination of its parent vectors. So um, if we take a collection of vectors of say what I have seen on Netflix, what Jeffrey has seen on Netflix, what each of you have seen on Netflix, but we want to reduce those features into a smaller thing, um, we would get smaller vectors, but each vector would be composed of all of our tastes. So it becomes D or sorry, it becomes ambiguated, but it becomes easier for the computer computer to do uh, machine learning. Um, we have talked about topic modeling already. Unsupervised learning is also helpful for doing recommendation systems. So collaborative filtering is one example of unsupervised learning. We can talk about that. I think I think there is a recommendation system slide later on where I'll talk about that, which I think is really cool. But yeah, that also uses unsupervised learning. Um, finally, the third um, method of doing machine learning is reinforcement learning. And this is considered the most cutting edge. Um, so things like playing chess or playing Go, where you have a set of rules, but you don't really have a list of well-known methods to win. So you let the computer figure out what happens. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, so you have an agent who acts with an environment. Um, the agent think, sorry, the agent perceives the environment in a form that is called the state. So every time it sees a state, so currently say it's at state zero. The state is perceived, but the agent can also manipulate the environment via some actions. 
Um, and these, these actions are just a small set of things that the agent can do. So for example, when you're playing chess, actions will be a rule of, uh, sorry, a list of valid chess rules. Like you can't make a chess piece fly out of the board or something. That's not, would not be a valid action. But there is a list of valid actions that the agent can perform. After performing one action, the environment updates its state and sends a state update to the agent, which the agent now sees. So it now goes into state one and so on. What is additionally passed to the agent is something called the reward. Remember, rewards can be negative or positive. So that mouse, for example, if, if the mouse was doing the action, of going through the maze um, and it finally found the cheese, it would be a positive reward. But if it got trapped in a trap, mouse trap, it would be a negative reward. The aim of giving these rewards is the agent will do a slightly different action based on whether the reward was positive or negative. And with the hope that it will reach the final goal state. So the goal might be, the goal might be something like um, winning the chess game. Um, there are only limited chessboard states where it is classified as a winner. So this state is usually defined by whoever is designing the reinforcement system. Um, it could also be something like making a robot learn to walk. So the final state would be something like, maybe I put the robot there and I want the robot to go out of the class. As soon as it crosses the threshold without having fallen over, that is the final state. So this would be defined by you. This would be defined by you, the original state where it starts from, and this would be defined by you. Everything else, oh, and I guess the environment conditions. So like where there are chairs in the room, what the flooring is of, where there are humans sitting, um, so the, I mean, that state zero, anyway. Um, and the rewards are specified by you. Everything else is unknown at pretty much the wide, wide west. So when a robot, like the Boston Dynamics robot, like you must have, people must have seen videos of the robot dog, um, that pretty much uses it for some logic. So when it, when it fails, it learns from its own failures rather than somebody telling, like basically going in there and fixing its legs or whatever. So I think that's really cool. Um, and I really enjoy the fact that this type of system that was considered a completely different paradigm from supervised and unsupervised machine learning is now collaborating with existing machine learning systems because um, it's just more powerful. Um, so that, that is really interesting. Any questions so far? Um, I think that I'm supposed to give people a break now. Do people want like the water break or should we power through and end early? What's the consensus? Early? Yes, yes, okay. Um, I need to be important, but, but I can do it while teaching. Um, a lot of problems really boil, especially when you're going to design bias systems, a lot of problems really boil down to design. And we will talk about this a lot. A, a new paper actually came out um, by Suresh, uh, which talks about machine learning model bias has historically been seen as a data problem, but it's also massively a design problem. And model designers cannot be excused of the problems that happen because you chose certain parameters and the legal ramifications of so. So I'll read the paper and if I find it cool, I'll add it when it's appropriate. Um, but I'm really excited for the paper. So it is highly possible to hide problems in a model at a design stage by choosing to make it say classification instead of regression, right? So um Having something being classified as 84 versus 104 are two very different things. But you, if you only had a cold and a hot class, you would have been able to hide that effect. Um, so I think well, choosing what you do is important. Um, anyway, there are regression and classification paradigms uh, in supervised learning. 
and every choice you make matters. Uh, regression might also be used for some other cool techniques. Uh, so if you had a query and you are a pair, so yes. So you have a list of URLs on the right that came up when probably somebody searched for Wall of China. Um, so we are collecting every feature that pops up when you do the search. So you have log frequency of query and text. So basically, how many times the Great Wall of China appears in the URLs and text? Um, you know, if it appears more than once, like these, these are called the anchor text. These are grabbed from the URLs, how many times they appear. And then because that can be a large number, we take the log of it to compress it. Um, query word in color on page one. Yes. A number of images, number of outlinks, page rank. Do people know what page rank is? Not so very important. I think page rank, uh, or sorry. Uh, page rank is a model that Google founders came up with to um, calculate the importance of a page. It just uses the network, like what page links to what other page. Um, so that is a number. So every page on the internet has a page rank number. It's a pretty simple algorithm, not required for this class right now, but if anyone's interested, we can talk about it. But yes, page rank, page rank is calculated for a different algorithm and which is a page rank. So all of these input features and the output feature would be something like a relevance value. So we are calculating for each query, what is the relevance of um, that query URL pair? So when you search for Great Wall of China, what is the relevance of this? What is the relevance of this? What is the relevance of this? Um, and we want regression because we want them, we want to rank, as uh, opposed to just having relevant or not relevant as a classes, because how do you Say the first five results are relevant. How do you order them correctly? So we need some uh, form of way to differentiate them. So this ranking problem can be reduced as a regression problem, um, as an example. So we have now talked about two paradigms. We first talked about rule-based systems, and we saw that um, there basically is no learning involved. All of the learning is involved is by expert humans who are looking into these programs or hand designing rules. But now we have talked about the second paradigm, classic machine learning things like regression things, like classification things, like um, older style models. Um, they learn via mapping from features. So this is the unknown black box. You design a model like you pass a CNN, but with every weight uninitialized as some random value. Then it learns over time and assigns importance to different things by learning the weights. And so, uh, yeah, so now people have introduced, or in classic machine learning, people introduced a thing that effectively replaced requiring having expert people to come up with these rules, but make these models learn, the, learn rules themselves. It does not completely obviate humans. You still have to do some feature engineering. For example, like I said, you still have to crop, brighten, sharpen, rotate your images before you send it into a visual recognition system because otherwise the model will learn curious correlations. Um, the model might, for example, if, if your data set had every woman uh, or every femme presenting person wearing an earring while you are training the data, without checking for curious correlations, the model will then classify everybody with earrings as a woman. And so if a man wears an earring, that would be classified. So you still have to hand design features. But we have learned now, oh sorry, we have now come to a stage where you have a component in the pipeline which has to be learned from uh, there. But then we didn't stop there. We now have modern machine learning. So what's, what's next? Um, so simple machine learning uh, heavily uh, or learning depends heavily on the representation of the data. Um, but obviously you have to do some feature removal even, not just like you can't add everything and expect it to work correctly. Um, and that in itself is a task that consumes a lot of work. Right? For example, here, 
you know, tire shape, tire size, all, all of these are weirdly important features that you have to be very careful about. So what did people then say? They said that, do we really need somebody to sit and type um, uh, or, or sorry, sit and edit images before you enter into the model. Like, how can we come up with a way that's better than somebody sitting and hand coding features? Um, so people used ML in even the feature engineering step, basically tools like attention. So what I'm trying to say is before transformers were a thing, people still had to do the work of labeling what features to look out for. So I don't know, something like mm, you, if you were doing it for a medical purpose, you would probably assign more importance to words of things that were medical diagnosis, names of diseases. But then people came up with these really cool techniques. Like for example, in transformers, there is this entire new layer called the attention layer, which is a, C, or which is a set of parallel layers that learn to give importance to the importance word, important words based on how many times they occur and their co-occurrences with other things. Essentially, that removes the need for the model designer to have deep knowledge of the domain itself. So effectively, if I was using currently a transformer-based system like Word, um, whatever the document I fed it, I would reasonably have confidence that it would pick up on the most important words in that document. Um, and I don't necessarily need to be an expert in say UN policy if I'm feeding it a bunch of policy documents to classify, you know, what what group it should belong in or so on. I don't need to be a policy expert. I, I, I can reasonably be confident that the attention feature is learning things. One cool example of this type of learning is also in machine translation. So I don't know, is anybody, is anybody bilingual? Um, yes, uh, what language do you speak? I don't speak Gujarati, I wish I could, but um, I'm trying to think like, there was this really cool example in machine translation, which would show you what I'm talking about. Okay, maybe, maybe I can do it in Hindi and that's where we have to go. So I need a mango. So what I'm trying this. I'm writing in Roman. Muche a um here. If I wrote it in the library script, it would have taken it forever. So sorry about that. Um now. Machine translation, before machine translation existed, people would have had to manually reorder the target language because we did not, uh, people, oh, sorry, the models weren't smart enough to understand what words meant what word in the corresponding language. So um, it would do really silly things like, for example, this is mango in Hindi. Uh, this is need, this is a, uh, and this is fine. So while translating, it would start with mujhe, which is fine, correct? But then the next word it would do is need. So it would do, it would put chahi here and so on. Because it did not know, it, the, the RLM would have just tried to, or LSTM would have just tried to predict the next word by doing word by word translation. That would have been wrong. But now, using attention mechanism in transformers, it knows which word is most related to which other word in the target document without anybody having to teach it this. You know, languages have different subject for pair orderings um, and so on. So it basically then removes the need for the designer to know that target language. And so Google switched from the rules-based statistical machine translation system to a transformer-based system. Four years ago, when BERT came out, or whenever BERT came out, I need to Google this, but whenever Transformers came out and their machine translation has immensely improved, so much so that now 
um, underrepresented, under-resourced languages like Hawaiian are pretty well translated. Like I spoke to some Hawaiian people earlier this year at South by Southwest and they were very surprised um, because there doesn't exist a lot of Hawaiian text corpus on the internet. It's a very protected language. But even with little data, it can do a lot of translation. Um, so it basically removes a lot of programmers' domain expertise requirements. Um, and so we're in a new paradigm of deep learning where these things are possible. Um, and so yes, your question earlier, how do internal representations work? This is what it looks like in a CNN-based um, facial recognition system. Um, when people try to plot what these models learn internally, they found that it creates these really cool patterns, which basically were like edges that were considered important by the model. Um, something like when the edges try to describe a person, it will probably predict a person. This probably looks like an insect. This probably looks like a car, like the wheels. Um, it is also very interesting how every layer is a combination of previous layers. So the input layers are just pixels, but in the first stage, it gets a bit more complicated. You still don't know what these are. But it's basically a combination of the previous layer. This is how CNNs work. Each layer is slightly smaller than the previous layer, right? So layer one might, sorry, layer two might be a, just a combination of nine pixels of the previous layer. And so that becomes this blotch, which still doesn't mean anything, but it's a blotch that will assign the most important weight out of these three. So it becomes a combination. Um, again, the second layer is now learning things like corners and contours by combining these notches um, into it itself. So as you go higher up, it becomes more and more interesting and complicated, and finally, it's not a cool model. This is a very, very simple uh, description of how a CNN works, but have a long and wide enough CNN, and you will have better accuracy. At least that's what the deep learning paradigm is, and it's very striking because deep learning has this problem of double descent, so people were initially, they were designing statistical systems. I'm sure everybody is at least somewhat familiar with what uh, overfitting is in statistics. So, you know, in, in regular statistics, Regular statistics, you have this problem of overfitting, where this is probably a very optimal solution. But if you put too many weights or, or parameters to learn, it would probably learn a function like this. right? And then when you had a new circle here, it would not be able to classify it correctly because it's just overlearned. The interesting thing about deep learning, which people still aren't sure about, is when you make a model bigger and bigger and bigger. So like, I think GPT 3.5 was 175 billion parameters. Um, the loss gradient, um, when you increase size. So, yeah. So when you increase size, initially it is learning better. But that reaches a point, like there is a training that uh, you and in fact moving beyond that is going to then cause it to overfit and learn poorly or generalize poorly but then people observe that when you add even more parameters it suddenly starts learning better again like this is where we are with 175 billion for example this probably is like a single parameter or or yeah single parameter like a straight line in a regression and this is probably like your run of the mill neural network with like maybe three or 10 layers of these of neurons. Um, so we still don't know why the second descent happens, what is happening. A lot of people call it emergent behavior that models are learning to become intelligent as humans because you give them as many neurons as the human brain has. All these are philosophical discussions and people have tried to look into what happens under the hood. Um, I think the papers that have looked into them are too mathy and advanced for this. Like they, these are page level papers, so we don't need to think about them that much. But the gist of that aside was that 
we don't know why extremely massive machine learning systems generalize better because going from statistical theory on top top, it shouldn't, but it still does. So it's probably learning to combine features in interesting ways that learn about the world in ways that we don't know. Um, any questions? Yes. I have a comment, but I saw this like article that was like saying that like emergent abilities are kind of like, uh, to measure the emerging abilities, like, like something like a string match or something, but like you just like classify two things as incorrect. How incorrect it is. So like it's like not really a thing the way that people are making it. Mm -hmm. So Yes, so emergent behaviors of LLMs is a problematic thing. I think we, I, I want to talk more about this in, in, when we start talking about generative models. But I'm, I think that image about double descent was more like literally looking at the loss. Are people familiar with what loss is in, in training machine learning models? The error of classifying, sorry, the error of learning the training data itself. So that's that, and, and that gets better with an ever larger model, which you know should not happen with a test set. Um, but yes, uh, people look at that image, that image that is several years old, and say that that is why uh, emergent behaviors happen. But it's not here. Right? Uh, like measuring intelligence should not be a benchmark; it should be more complicated than that. So it's a very nuanced problem. But I think what I'm trying to again say is that. We don't know really, we don't know very well what happens inside these layers. Like when you start coding um, neural networks, you will find that people add things like batch norm. What is batch norm? Batch norm is just taking a batch of data and normalizing the values before feeding it into the next layer somewhere here. What does batch norm do? We don't know. We just know that it works. Like there is a whole lecture that was given at ICLR or ICML, one of the two. Um, where the speaker basically trashed on batch norm for a whole hour and said, we don't know what we're doing. We're just doing it because somebody else did it and the accuracy went up by like 5%. So that's why we're doing it. But we don't know what we don't, we don't know what we don't know. And therefore we can possibly explain what's happening inside in a manner that is satisfactory to people who are depending on these systems. So this is fine, whatever. We are this we are very whether it's a car person or animal. But when this type of a system is being fed in a smart driving vehicle and it kills somebody, who's responsible? And not just who is responsible and accountable, but how would you ensure that this doesn't happen? Because we don't know what's happening inside. We just point to things like that and say, oh. We just increase the number of parameters by 10 billion because in theory that should be better because it did better with like our test sets and the car had less accidents when we tested it. But we go into the real world and it sees something like it was, uh, it sees something that had not been seen during tests and it causes real world problems. One cool example that I remember off the top of my mind, it just came to me was um, has anybody seen how like Tesla's while driving show? in the form of a graphic, what it, what the front cameras are seeing, like what it shows up while you're parking or something, or even while driving, it shows the cars that are ahead of you, like a video game. There was this cool example I saw on the internet where a car was behind another massive truck that was carrying traffic signals. Like it was just a set of traffic signals on top of the truck. A human would not be confused by it. I would see it and be like, oh, cool. And I would like drive past it. That poor man's car, continued to be automatically braked because um the 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 sorry the Tesla thought that it was in front of a bunch of traffic signals in the middle of a highway. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like I don't think we can anticipate what problems can happen in the real world or we still don't know with confidence what's happening inside. And we will talk about explainability a lot in this class when we get there. But even explainability methods are a best case approximate of what it thinks the model is. Like this, when you print this image on the screen, you get these colors, but you still don't know, like you know that the machine is assigning some importance to this edge and it looks like a face to you, but you don't know what, I don't know, you don't know what these, is, these are. 
Um, and this is a simplistic example. I'm talking about something like a lab that is one of 175 billion parameters. You extract a layer and it's just garbage numbers and you don't know what those are. But that model is deployed in the real world, giving misinformation to people. Somebody last year in Belgium killed themselves while talking to GPT. Like the model told him to leave his wife and fall in love with the model and he just got depressed and killed himself. Um, Anyway, sorry, we went a bit dark, but basically we don't know fully well what's happening inside. People are still learning, doing things, trying their best to but there's a lot of disagreement. Um, maybe I will send the bachelor video out as an email because I thought that was a really funny video. Like somebody went to a conference and just shit on other researchers for a full hour. Um, anyway, so sorry about that long spiel, but I, I hope that was funny. Um, we currently use large deep learning models because they try and understand the world as a hierarchy of concepts. Um, and what I mean by hierarchy of concepts is that it goes beyond what the data looks like, but also deep learning is capable of looking at several different types of data and trying to build relations. Um, you know, right now we have multimodal systems that can in accept as input both text and images and still do something useful with it. Um, weights are, uh, sorry, and the other thing that the first point means is that with enough, um, let's see, yes, yes. So in, in uh, image generation systems, people have been able to extract different layers from, the, from between and try and see which layers corresponded to what. Um, and so you can do really cool things like say an image generation system is generating a person, like it say generates this. You could, it is possible there are techniques that let you investigate the uh, models, intermediate layers to find which one is responsible for my t-shirt color and like, like change it to black or blue or something. Um, Kyoto did experiments with that Levi paper. They changed. Um, and with that, people have done really cool things like understand which of these layers correspond to say, again, say this was a generation system as opposed to just ending here, say it was it continued and created another image. Um, you can do really cool things like figure out which layers are responsible for a person's hair length and increase the person's hair length or figure out what response to that person's perceived gender and change that. And there are cool papers we can, um, I can send some examples of this and maybe talk about some cool examples of this with next slide. They're not on this slide, but yeah, you can do GAN manipulations to change people's um, uh, presentations. In fact, there are YouTube videos which you could look up and I would encourage you to do so where people do random walks in the intermediate space just by like literally changing values inside these inter inside parameters and creating these cool animations where like one person slowly transforms into another and so on. Has anybody seen videos like that? Those are all created using random walks using the PL space.
perhaps one example. So um, just by manipulating the inner layers of the model, basically somebody figured out what the what the innermost layer that is strongly correlated with gender is, and then is moving that needle forward or backward in space, in the GAN space or in the network space. And when I do that, the final output changes its um, binary represented gender. So you can do really cool stuff in deep learning because each innermost layer learns a different concept from the data set itself. That is like harder for human beings to do. For example, like you can't really come up with a way to convert a man's face into a woman's face, but models can do cool things like that because it learns things in a higher dimensional embedding that we aren't really um, sure of how to do that. We normally guess. Can you explain a little bit more? Um, yeah, um, let me try to. So, say you have a, say you have a text to image generation system, or sorry, say you have a deep learning system like an auto encoder, which looks like this. These are all layers that successively go smaller and then larger in size. Um, so the point of an autoencoder is to take a bunch of images, you know, set of images, and then recreate them as best as possible. And when you are able to reach a space where the final image looks like exactly the same as the input image, then what people do is they delete this reflection of the model. And now that you have a set of vectors, say that the, the layer corresponding to this was a vector of size. Um, so it was a vector of size 30. Um, so what now we can do is see how each of these vectors corresponds to a change in this final image. So what happens if this, if I change the value of this vector from zero to one? Does anything change? What changes? Like does the t-shirt color change? Or does the hair length change and so on? So essentially the um, auto encoder model has managed to encode different concepts of a person's image into a vector of size 30, right? Each of the cells in this vector represents something different in the final image. And so tinkering with this is causing that. So the video you just saw was somebody taking this vector into a 30 dimensional space, like 30 dimensional, so this is 3D. But when you take it into a 30 dimensional space and say the original image was somewhere in this space, in that 30 dimensional space, and you just randomly move it around. So you, when you randomly move it around in such a large continuous space, you get those cool animations where the image is like very gradually morphing into something else. So that's what I'm saying. That's the power of deep learning. Like it, the these networks are so deep and stacked that it goes beyond just recognizing edges and stuff to actually starting to recognize more complex concepts like hair length, hair color, t-shirt color. None of these were pen. Like when those images were talked to the model, nobody attached to things saying this person is wearing a t-shirt, which is green. That's something that the model learned. And we step into the middle of this model and we can now then manipulate this thing. Is that clear? If asking no. questions, but it's a very interesting thing that I also found really cool when I learned it for the first time. Um yeah, so that's what the hierarchy of concepts means. Um, and these things are learned by gradient descent. Pretty simple. Everyone does with gradient descent. We will talk more about this in this class. Uh, but it, uh, it takes an objective function and tries to minimize the loss from that objective function by moving into that whatever dimensional space and uh, space. 
finally reaching a point where the loss is minimum. So in this example that I just gave you, the loss would be reconstruction loss. How different is the generated image from the input image? So you would define a function that would consider like calculate something like pixel differences between the two images. And then we would move in this space inside the function to learn these weights so that that loss becomes zero or as close to zero as possible. Um, and then we get to do these cool things. So that's like a very uh, rough idea of what loss means. And by the way, that double descent thing, that's, that's what I was talking about here. This loss is what I was talking about uh, in the double descent. Um, so these are much newer techniques. So we went from classic machine learning where the only thing that was learned was having from features to um, representation learning where not only are the mappings from features learned, but the features themselves are also sometimes learned. Like we need, we don't know, uh, we don't need to have domain expertise anymore to decide which features are important. We use tools like attention to label which features become important. Um, and then we talked about deep learning where not only are there simple features that are learned from the, that are learned like this, but then you have additional layers which become features of features. So uh, something like t-shirt color is a more complex concept that is learned because of adding of new layers. Um, and you obviously have a get feature mappings and all. So that's the newer paradigm we have deep learning. Um, finally, 2023, we have generative AI. Um, I think I've talked enough times about this that there is nothing really new to say. Um, the one new thing I will say about image generation models is now they use text to image generation as opposed to image, as opposed to image, to image generation. So it's slightly more sophisticated because now you don't have to have a vector which you don't know what it means until you see the output. You can actually type things like a purple cow. Um, so the way those are trained are by co-learning and image reconstruction along with the input text. Um, and once this, so basically then what happens is this innermost embedding becomes a complex embedding of both word vectors and image vectors. And so then when you manipulate the word vectors, the final limit changes. So that's how that works, um, very roughly speaking. And uh, chat GPT is an example of what is called an autoregressive model, which basically is a transformer uh, with the first half cutoff. So it's uh, so usually in fully connected transformers, sorry, it's a word. In non-autoregressive transformers, I think, um, every word is learned, every word's representation is learned from both the words that come after it and the words that come before it, like that's the full context provided. But in autoregressive transformers or in autoregressive LLMs, it learns only from all of the words that have come in the past. And its only job is to predict the next words that come in the sequence. So that's a very simple explanation, but that is why I keep claiming that ChatGPT is a token completion model. And the way you can test it today yourself is just paste a long block of text. And eventually with enough tabling, you will see that it just starts to continue that text instead of saying, oh, this looks like, you know, it's not like a person doing conversation. It's essentially completing a bunch of texts. That's how autoregressive text models work. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the lecture. And we can finish early. However, before we disperse, next class, there is no homework, but we will be doing some very basic machine learning setup so that everyone's prepared to start doing their projects. So we will go through Jupyter Notebooks in class. Jeffrey will be leading that class with some machine learning concepts so that you're comfortable with coding in Python, PyTorch, um, like it learn and so on. If people are familiar with this, you will find the homework easy, but this is meant for, again, everybody to be at some basic level so that we can start doing cool research projects together. All right, I think that's it for today. Thank you for coming.